All right, everyone. So in this video, I'm going to show you how you can leverage caching to improve the performance of your web APIs. So before we get to this example, let me show you instead what I currently have and what is the problem and how we can fix it step by step. So here, let's imagine that we have our user and he's going to make a get request to another user profile. So you can imagine that this is going to be a social management application or social network. Uh, this is the project used on the uh, backend engineering cars. I'm going to show you what this project is in a bit. But basically what happens is this is the usual and probably the flow you're used to. So you fetch something to the database. So in this case, you're going to fetch the user uh, data and then the database sends to the server and the server sends to the user. So pretty standard so far. And in our use case, of course, this is a bit uh, hypothetical because this is just for educational purposes. Uh, our request is not that slow. We could even use another endpoint, which is a bit slower, but still I'm using Golang. Golang is super fast, um, if you know what I mean. So this is the flow. Um, and now let's say here is our bottleneck. The, this fetch of a user takes a while. Let's say that it takes a couple of seconds. So we know for sure that the, the database here is the, is the bottleneck. So how can we fix this with caching? And just before we go see the codes on how is the code structure and how all of that, um, I want to mention that this is going to be a very good improvement to our project. Not only because we are caching the user profile, but because we fetch the user on every authenticated request. Uh, what we have here is that we have an authentication gateway here, and we fetch what is the user logged in, or meaning that we have a token-based authentication, and we get the token or the user ID from the token, and then we fetch mm -hmm. to see if the user really exists and all of those authentication and authorization middlewares we have. So this is a request and a round trip that's always made on every request. So it would be interesting to actually do some performance improvements here. And you could also argue that the performance improvements for authentication could also be isolated from uh, the user. So we could even cache the authentication token instead of this uh, user response. But this is, after all, a video just to teach you this approach because you can honestly cache whatever you want. And speaking of caching, um, again, just before we get to the code, I just want to show you this slide here as well. And why would you want to do this? And what are the advantages uh, against just storing on a relational database? So the most obvious advantage that uh, cache or, for example, Redis uses is that it stores information on memory, on RAM, instead of, for example, um, of course, the traditional databases nowadays use a combination of both, both Redis or Postgres, they also store on memory. But if you want to persist data, you need to write it to, to disk. And here is the big advantage is that RAM is way faster to access data for input and output operations than uh, disk. So that's why you might want to cache some temporary data on your cache instead of going to always to the uh, to disk to, to search for that data. Okay, so that's the main advantage. The disadvantage is that um, in memory storage is way more expensive than uh, disk. So that's an obvious one as well. And you cannot persist data on uh, RAM because if the machine crashes or something like that, you lose your data. So a combination of both is the most desirable approach. And then use cases for caching. Uh, these all are use cases I teach on the backend engineering course. Uh, if you're interested, I'm going to show you the project in a bit. Uh, so high frequent access endpoints. This is what we're going to solve for and expensive computations. Imagine that you have an expensive computation. This might be a good candidate for caching, especially if it's something that it doesn't change that often. So caching is good for this because otherwise you'd have to reinvalidate your cache whenever something changes. Uh, I'm going to show you that in, in details if you're not sure what I'm talking about. Uh, also, rate limiting is pretty nice to solve with caching. Because again, it falls in the same bucket of high frequency access endpoints or data, and then token session management is also a nice use case. So here we are in VS Code. 
and this is going to be the project I'm going to show you for uh, for a practice. And if you're wondering what this project is, this is the the social the Goofer social network project that we've built on the backend engineering cars. If you're interested on how to build all of this from scratch, from TCP to deployments, uh, I teach that on the backend engineering course. It's the first link in the description. So here on the slash users slash, we have the get user handler. This is the endpoint used to, to perform the, the fetch of a profile. You can see here the documentation and all of that that we generate with Swagger. Uh, but here is the important thing. All we do is that we go to our database. Uh, of course, here is everything abstract. We go to the storage. But somewhere around here, we do a get user by ID here. And this is basically the query we use. So pretty simple. And of course, this is not going to be a bottleneck. Uh, I'm going to show you some tests. I'm going to make some benchmark tests that are going to show some performance boost, but it's not going to be that noticeable. It's going to be pretty much like 30% improvement, but still it's already fast. Of course, this is just theory, but the important bit here is that we're just making a request to the database just like that flow, and then we're sending this to the user, okay? So from what we have already learned, uh, how can we solve this? And if we go back to our drawing, to our initial drawing, here is our flow, and the solution or the, the way to make our request faster is to not go to disk. Instead, we should go to um, in-memory storage. So here I'm going to add a cache and in our use case, I'm going to add Redis into our projects, which is going to spin up uh, our request way much faster. So instead of going directly to the database, we're going to first check if the user key is already cached. And if it's not cached, for example, the first time requesting this user profile, we're going to go to the database get the user profile data and then set it, the cache from the database. So the next time someone uh, asks for this user profile, it's already cached and we can just uh, return the query that was response from the, uh, the, data, the database. One thing to note here is that we should set a timer or an amount of time we want to cache our keys. Otherwise, our data might be stale. For example, we're going to solve this with TTLs, which is going to be a, a time to live in seconds that we're going to set in our Redis. Uh, I'm going to show you in a bit. And this is going to, of course, avoid going to the database all the times. When the user gets request again, he's just going directly to the cache and to the cache to the user browser. And this is even more useful in our project because we are building a social network. Uh, and there is a problem of celebrities or hotspot accounts. So some accounts might be requested way more than another. So caching that response might make our application more fluid to the users. So the first thing I'm doing is that I'm adding this Redis container in our Docker Compose file. Pretty simple. But before we even write any code, I want to show you uh, what is the output from all of these requests that you're going to make. So we are familiar with what we're doing. So let me just put up the API. Here is just generating some documentation. You can see that Redis is already connected because I have already done that setup work. Again, the goal of this video is to show you the solution. But before doing the solution, I have already made a lot of setup. Um, again, this would take almost an hour to set, show you everything, the setup. But I do cover that in a course step by step. So here I'm on the documentation for the API and I have just authorized myself with a token so that I can make authenticated requests. This is all of the endpoints we have. Uh, I'm particularly interested in this one that we started looking at, the user ID. So we're going to fetch the user ID for this profile. So let's execute and see if this user even exists. It does. So here we have just a sample of data and we're going to start benchmarking this in a bit. So let's go back to the code and let's implement a very quick solution to solve this. So just to quickly give you some context on what is already uh, being done, I have created an environment variable called um, Redis, Redis config. So here we have the configuration to our Redis um, instance. And I have here uh, basically a feature flag or a toggle, meaning that Redis is enabled or not, the default is false. 
And this is important because I don't want to couple Redis to our API or any other caching. I want this to be uh, optional. If I want to, to turn it off for some problem, for some reason, I can do it via environment variables very easy. And this is going to also allow us to do a benchmark with the Redis enabled and Redis disabled um, to see the benchmark improvements. Other than that, I have here a Redis instance that I create. And basically, I also check if it's enabled. We're going to do something similar in just a bit. And then I inject these dependencies into our application, which then we just run it. Okay. So the point that we need to change is, of course, here on the users. But also, you mean I mentioned that we should also fix the or improve the user fetching on the authentication layer. Because here is the middleware for authentication. So it's pretty simple. We just fetch the token from the headers. We parse it. We check if it's a valid JWT. We get the user ID from the claims. And finally, we fetch the user from the database from this method here. And this is what we're going to be implementing. Before, what we did was that we just fetched the user from the, the, the persistence data storage like this. However, what we're going to do now, if you remember from the diagram, is that we should first go to the cache and see if this user ID key does exist. If it does, we can just send the, the response. Otherwise, we need to do the whole flow again. Okay. Uh, and of course, all of this, if, if the Redis is enabled. So the first thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to check if we have Redis enabled, because if we don't, we can just go to the database and just fetch the user and early return from this function. Otherwise, if Redis is indeed enabled, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go to the cache storage, to the user's interface and go get the user by ID. So what this is going to do is that it's going to run this function here. So this is basically an implementation of a Redis uh, get by ID, user by ID. Here is a cache key, which is user and the user ID. We fetch it and we just marshal it and return it. So here we're going to have a user. If it does exist, if it has already been cached, if it has not been cached, meaning that the user is nil, we are going to get the user from the Postgres database. And then we need to set that user on the Redis cache so that the next request is going to be faster and cached. And then at the end, we just return either user, um, either from the cache or from Postgres. So let me just save this. And basically, we have just implemented this whole flow. Of course, <laughs> it, it was fast because I have already coded this before. But this is a high overview that you can code yourself uh, if you want, or just check it out how I did it on the on the backend engineering. But this is basically it. So let's run some benchmarks with Redis disabled first and see what's going to happen. So to quickly benchmark our solution without caching, I have here just restarted our API without uh, the Redis instance on. So I have set that variable to false. You can see that there's no message of the, the Redis instance being started. What I'm going to do to test is that I'm going to run this CLI tool called AutoCannon, which is going to basically make HTTP requests to these endpoints with, with 10 connections and five seconds. So this is going to be a lot of requests so that we can have a good average and Again, this is going to be fast requests relatively and the results might vary a lot. So let's see if you can get some good results at first. So you can see that the average is three milliseconds, not the best, not the worst, uh, but here is the, the other percent also. Most of the requests are actually below these values, okay? And here you can see that we have just made 14,000 requests, which resulted in 200 status code. So all of them worked, okay? So if couple of them didn't work, uh, this would be also, uh, it would skew a bit the results. So I have just restarted the server again, but with Redis cache connection established. Now let's do the same request and see what are the results. And it's going to be a little bit slower because I'm doing some extra logging. Actually, I should do this test again without the logging. But here are the results. You can see that the average is 2 seconds and 38. And before it was three milliseconds. So we got a boost of performance already just by using caching. And we are going to do a smaller test to see if it, this is actually going to the cache because I have, uh, because of those logs. But you can see that the 99% is eight. Here is also eight, but 
most of the other ones are faster by one or two milliseconds so again these tests are a bit hard to see because the, the endpoint is fast but you can see that we still got um, a good result from that now those logs that i mentioned are these ones here that i have just added for us to see how is the process and if it's going according to plan so let's go to swagger and do this request again so i'm just going to hit execute and here is the user super fast and let's see what happened behind the scenes so forget this error here uh, but here is the request that we have made which is it started using the cache because it's enabled it didn't find the user in cache and then it sets the user in cache so this request went to the database if we try again we can see that it's used cache and we don't have any more requests and this happens because the user was found on a cache, so it didn't go inside this uh, if statement. So it actually used for, it used the user from the cache. And if we try it again and again, you're going to see the same exact result. As you can see, there we go. We just went to the cache instead of using um, the user from the database. And just to finish the video, I just want to show this small detail, how we are setting the user on the database, because I didn't show you that on the, on the cache. I mean, doing pretty much the same thing. We're marshalling. And here we're gonna set with an expiration, which I mentioned before. And this is the amount of time. So basically for a minute, the user is gonna be on the cache for a minute. After that, he's going to be um, deleted from there automatically. And also I delete the user from the cache every time the user updates his or her profile. So this is also important. Otherwise you would get stale data from the cache if you don't revalidate it once you update the, the user profile, for example. So that is one thing to, to take into consideration. But other than that, this is pretty much the solution I wanted to show you guys. Again, if you're interested in seeing more of these, check out the first link in the description and I hope you enjoyed this video.